Hello, my name is Matt Groves, doing a series of short videos to walk you through the basics of RabbitMQ and EasyNetQ. I'm going to be talking about the whys and the hows. In this video, I'm going to show you the basics of what queuing can give you and how the producer, broker, consumer architecture works. So, I want you to imagine a deli. It's lunchtime. There's a long line of customers. But unlike the deli in this picture, the deli I'm imagining only has one employee. So they only serve one customer at a time. The employee takes the order, goes back, makes the sandwich, and then gives you the sandwich, takes your payment. Then they shout out, next, and repeat the process with the next customer. So just think of a deli like that, just one employee only. And, and that's a pretty lousy deli, I'd say. It might be okay if there's only one or two customers in line, but suppose there are 100 customers, or it's a busy lunchtime. Uh, this deli is going to get backed up really, really fast. So what should they do? Well, they should hire more people, of course. They could have one employee take the orders and one employee to make the sandwiches, or, or two or three employees to make the sandwiches. So the person at the register takes down the order, puts it up on a, a rack, a little rack to put the little paper order tickets, and then the sandwich makers will reach up on the rack and pull down an item from the rack, make the sandwich, and uh, give it to the customer. Much more efficient. There's no switching. Um, employees have one task that they're assigned to, and this is a little more scalable because you could have two or three or four employees and they can all pull from that same uh, ticket rack. So, surprise, this is a metaphor for what we're talking about. Um, it's, this is an architecture that involves three pieces. A producer, a broker, and a consumer. So, in um, our metaphor, the producer is the order taker at the deli. But imagine we have uh, an app, uh, like a web endpoint, and that is the, the producer. It takes in requests from uh, an API consumer. And then the broker in the deli is the ticket rack. You know, the order taker writes down uh, a message on the ticket, make uh, the sandwich, uh, extra tomatoes, so and so, and puts it up on the ticket rack. And so in the architecture, the ticket rack is uh, some sort of AMQP implementation, uh, like a RabbitMQ server is what we're going to be talking about. And then finally, the last piece is the consumer. In the deli, this is the sandwich maker. Um, in our architecture, this will be some other process or processes, like a console app or a Windows service or, or some, something like that, that will actually take those messages out of RabbitMQ, do some work uh, with those messages. Um, so, I mean, hypothetically, we could do all that work within the web request, and we'll see that what that might look like here, but uh, if we don't need instant uh, responsive results, then we can just move that work off onto another process, and then I can get back to the business of just taking more requests. So as the web endpoint, my one job is to just write the messages down and hand them off to, uh, to Rabbit, and that's all I'm doing is just quickly as I can taking in requests. If, uh, and then those requests get processed by um, the console app or Windows service. And so hypothetically, if I get backed up, I can add more and more consumers, uh, I eat more sandwich makers. Uh, so the web is now freed up to serve more people. Um, and it, uh, so the consumers are then doing work that doesn't need to be done in a web process, you know, natural language processing, indexing, scraping, um, lots of uh, database traffic, complex querying or commands to the database. So just as an example, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, you've placed an order on Amazon. Now it may seem like, okay, I've placed the order, it happened instantly, but that's not really what happens, does it, right? You're not charged right away, you don't get all the uh, information right away, the, the tracking number and so on. So, but once you place that order, Amazon very quickly says, okay, we got the information that we need from you. And then later on, when they've, you know, when they're making the sandwich, right, 
they're going to send you an email uh, each step of the way. They say, okay, um, it, we verify that it's in stock, we've charged your credit card, and here's your receipt. Okay, and then later on when it's actually you know, picked out of a warehouse and, and shipped, they'll send you another email with a tracking number. Right, so those are sort of asynchronous processes that it wouldn't make sense for you to sit around and wait for a response from the website to have a tracking number. It could, could take hours to actually get that to happen. Could take could take days. And then, of course, sometimes you'll get the sorry, we're actually out of stock email. Right, so that just goes to show you that you don't need to know all the information and do all the processing right there in the web request. You can push that work off to later. So here's some pseudocode, just to, just to illustrate this in code. This is like an API endpoint. And so you make an HTTP request to this endpoint. The first thing it does, it does some time-consuming work. This is an expensive process, maybe reading or writing multiple database records, um, calculations, and so on. And then when it's done with that time-consuming work, it'll return a success response. So if I deployed an app like this, I'm really limited by the number of processes, number of requests that my web server can handle. And while it's doing this, this code here, it can't handle other requests coming in. So they've got to wait. Instead, let's break it up like this. So I'll have my endpoint here. Uh, it's going to just create a message, and then it's going to quickly put that message on the queue. So that's the very minimum it can do. Just create a message and put it on a queue and then return success. And then the queue is out there somewhere. It's holding these messages in, you know, in order or, or what have you. And there's some other consumer process out there, like a console app, that just loops through and says, OK, give me a message from the queue. I'll work on it. Give me the next sandwich order. I'll make the sandwich. So that's the while loop there. It's just looping through all those messages that are on the queue. It just keeps on working like that. So you, the, the, I didn't really show Rabbit in the code here, but there's this implication that there's another uh, server out there that's, that's holding these queues. So putting a message on the queue quickly, that's dumping it off into Rabbit. And then while I'm getting message from the queue, that's actually pulling from Rabbit. So here's our uh, obligatory box arrow, box arrow, just to demonstrate uh, high level what we're talking about here. Uh, so RabbitMQ and other AMQP implementations are called middleware. Uh, and this is why. They, they are just a broker that's in the middle between the order takers and the sandwich makers. And so that's, that's what we mean by, by middleware. It just sits right there in the middle. Now imagine we want to hire more employees. So all we have to do is spin up more instances of the consumer app. And so each of those consumer apps is going to be able to pull a message off. So we could pull three messages off, do the work, and then you know as they finish up, they can pull another message and keep going like that, and just consume all those messages from from the server. And meanwhile, the web app keeps just putting messages onto the RabbitMQ server as as fast as it can. So I can I can make three times as many sandwiches and I can keep adding more and more consumers. And for that matter, I can even uh, add more RabbitMQ nodes. So at some point, the RabbitMQ server might not be enough to handle all the requests. So I can add more nodes and create what's called a cluster of RabbitMQ servers. And I could even have multiple order takers, uh, different web endpoints on different places, um, all pushing same messages or different messages onto RabbitMQ. And those web apps don't have to be on the same server. They could be anywhere else. In fact, all these pieces, uh, most likely you want them on different machines. So they are just scaling independently. Each consumer app has its own machine with its own resources and so on. So with this architecture, I get all kinds of scaling all over the place in any one of these parts, any, in any of these parts individually or together. So that's the benefit you get from this uh, architecture. So that's all for this episode. Next episode, we're going to actually start looking at some setting, uh, setting up Rabbit here. So we'll set up a RabbitMQ server. I'll show you how to do that on Windows and on Linux. And we'll see that it doesn't really matter 
Windows or Linux, which one it's on. You can use it uh, either way with uh, Windows or Linux apps or web services. It's sort of interchangeable. We'll set up the management UI. I think this is a very useful tool to actually see what's going on inside RabbitMQ server. So we'll take a tour of the management UI, show you some of the basics of how to use that. Thanks for watching.